Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Data Diversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss emerging trends in data architecture. What's the next big thing? Sponsored today by Digital Realty. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A panel, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DA strategies. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to enable those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides and recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Dan for a brief word from our sponsor, Digital Realty. Dan, hello and welcome. Hi, thank you, Shannon. Hi, everybody. Some slides going for everybody. Looks good. All right. Hopefully everybody sees that okay. Yeah. So thank you, uh, everyone, for having me um, briefly today. My name is Dan Eline. I am Senior Director of Platform at Digital Realty. And I, uh, I'm i very excited. I'm really looking forward to Donna's presentation, as I'm, I'm sure you all are as well. Um, and and I you know, saw a couple of things that, that I just want to kind of mention and, and talk about. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm from Digital Realty, and, and those of you who do know who we are are possibly wondering to yourselves why the data center company is here to talk about, um, you know, data. And I, I sort of jokingly, but at the same time rather seriously, say that the, the clue is in the name, right? And, and data centers, or as, as I prefer to refer to them, centers of data are at the center of, of the data revolution. Um, and so... You know, I, I do want to talk about something that that we're doing that I think really fits in well um, at Digital Realty. Obviously, we sit at a unique vantage point. Um, you know, we're home to um, a large number of cloud provider deployments, um, large enterprise deployments, and and so forth. And and that gives us a unique vantage point. And you know, in terms of seeing what people are doing, obviously, we know, and as you'll see, and in the survey, if you've already read it, right, so many companies are, you know, on their way, or at least wanting to get on their way um, to go through a digital transformation, of their company, right, um, almost 65% of folks in the survey said that that's their top priority. And we see the same thing. And, you know, as a result of that, right, a lot of digital transformation really is powered by data, um, and, and can be is easily encumbered by data. So one of the things we've been doing is, you know, we've been looking at these kind of infrastructure patterns that are occurring, um, you know, within our four walls. And, and we see this, you know, massive growths of data. And, you know, we're thinking, what are people doing with this data? You know, where is it going? How can we start to predict or think about what's happening? And, and so um, a gentleman by the name of Dave McCrory about 10 years ago coined the phrase data gravity. And, and, and talking about you know, the, the mass of data and what that means. I'm fortunate enough to call Dave a colleague now. He's working with us at Digital Realty um, studying this phenomenon. And we've actually published um, the results, two editions already now of this study, we refer to as the Data Gravity Index. And what we're really you know, looking at and, and wanting to, to kind of you know, contribute to the industry is you know, we see this challenge. And, and we see data gravity as a challenge, and we see it as one of the biggest impediments to a successful digital transformation. So, you know, we're, we're really wanting to get the word out and have people understand that, hey, this could be a challenge, right? What does it mean? The other thing we want to do is, is inform some of the decisions we make, right? Because we're able to look at this data gravity phenomenon and actually start to make some predictions. How's it growing? Where is it growing? Um, you'll see, right, as of right now, our, the predictions show nearly 140% com compound annual growth in this data gravity, which is insane if you think about it. How's that happening? Well, it's it's us, right? It's this continuous continuous data creation life cycle, right? It's we we create data, and then you know we we do something with it, then we store it, and then you know it doesn't go there to do nothing. You know, then then folks like 
like myself start to look at it, right? We do analytics on it. We enrich that data that gets put back in and this perpetuates the cycle of the growth of data. So, you know, why, why us again, talking about it? As I said, I think we have a unique vantage point. Um, you know, we sit in the middle kind of between the, you know, the people, the, the locations, the things that are accessing, you know, these applications and, and generating this data, you know, both at sort of out at the edge and in the clouds. And, you know, since both of those environments can live with us, you know, we see this. And, and so, you know, when we talk about it, right, we sort of see the same thing, I think that, um, you know, you'll see again in the survey, the, the fact that when you look at, you know, challenges and the challenges around data management, well, who's handling that in, in organizations is the, the reality is I looked at that and I said, wow, there's a lot of varying titles, you know, in interacting and, and potentially either claiming to or someone else in the organization thinks they're responsible for this data management. And I see that same thing and, and, and we do. And one of the challenges is, you know, we know that, that not necessarily all these folks in the organization are talking to each other. And it's, it's kind of one of the challenges we see, you know, if, if the folks who are attempting to make this data useful and valuable aren't having a meaningful dialogue with the folks who support the infrastructure that can bring that data to life and actually help derive insights, that's gonna break down the process. So to try to work through that and help people, we, we've come up with a concept that we call pervasive data center architecture, which is really, it's a set of kind of, you know, it's, it's both prescriptive architectural patterns, but it's also methodology that we encourage people to consider using to solve those data gravity challenges, right? To, to have awareness of who are the, the people involved in the process? Where are the things? Where are your centers of data? And being intentional rather than accidental about where we place them, right? Because I, I think anyone who's been in IT um, for any period of time knows that, you know, so much of what we have is, is truly accidental. And, and it's not that we've been careless. It's just you know, these things have grown organically and we started out doing something really never imagining how far it would take off. But in, in order to harness that, make that data powerful, make that data, you know, whether it's monetized or help it generate insights or interact with it real time, you know, all these things that we aspire to be able to do as part of the digital transformation strategy, we have to be more methodical and more intentional about data. So we need to think about where our data needs to live so that we can get the most use out of it. And that's why we have the, you know, this concept of the methodology. And, and I would encourage you all to take a look at both the data gravity index, which um, we make available. It's, you can go to datagravityindex.com or you can find it from the Digital Realty website. Take a look at that and, and, and look at how that might affect you, the industry that you work in, some of the places in the world you might be you know, doing business or aspiring to do business. And also take a look at pervasive data center architecture where we actually talk about being thoughtful about data rather than accidental and making sure that we're, we're putting our data, the infrastructure that supports our data, positioning it so it can serve us best, generate those insights, potentially come up with new business models based on data. So as I said, feel free to go out and take a look at the data gravity index, you know, think about what it means to you, reach out to us if, if you have questions or, or ideas. And of course, throughout the course of, of the rest of this session, you know, feel free to put any questions you might have in the, in the chat or in the Q&A and uh, look forward to interacting with you and really looking forward to your session, Donna. Dan, thank you so much and for kicking us off. And thanks to Digital Realty for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. And if you have questions for Dan or about Digital Realty, you may submit your questions in the Q&A panel. And Dan will be joining us for the Q&A portion of the webinar at the end. Now, let me introduce the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years experience helping organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the managing director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me give the floor to Donna to get her presentation started. Hello and welcome. 
Hello, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure uh, to join these webinars and always nice to see some familiar faces or names, at least on the attendee list. Um, um, and if those, if you have not attended these webinars in the past, um, this is a series. This is, is a, we, we generally kick off the January with some sort of look forward looking trends. Um, and this year is no different. Um, you'll, you'll see a lineup throughout the year. We hope you can join these uh, going forward. Um, and I'm sure uh, Shannon will, will repeat at the end as well. These are all recorded. Uh, so if you missed either these or ones from last year, you can always go to Data Diversity uh, website and, and catch those. So um, what are we going to talk about today? So uh, Dan had, had mentioned a survey and some of you may have seen that. If not, it's available um, on the Data Diversity website. Um, and we, we did a survey on these uh, this idea of trends and data management. We really kind of want to walk through that both from a technological point of view, which is a big part of architecture, but also, um, and Dan mentioned this as well, is kind of from that people process and, and governance point of view. And, and the survey kind of covers all of that. Um, so, so, you know, what, what is what is new and what isn't? I think what isn't is that we're we're we have data driven business, and that's really driving a lot of um, what's happening today. I think you know you'll see over seventy percent of the survey respondents said that their organization field sees data as a strategic asset. I think that's great. I don't think that's surprising anymore. I think those of us who are in the business, though, um, should be heartened by that. I remember I always tell the story, you know, I've been doing a lot of the you know, data diversity and EDW type you know, conferences for years. And it used to always be the topic of, oh, we don't get attention from the business. No one cares about us. We're in the back server room. And I often say, well, be careful what you ask for, right? Because now the spotlight is definitely upon data. Uh, so if you're looking to hide, you're probably in the wrong career um, because that, that also comes with responsibility. What I found interesting, um, but perhaps not surprising in, in some sense, is you know a big driver of data as a strategic asset is reporting and analytics. Um, I think that's been true for probably since data has been, um, you know, it, it, it around. If you look at cave dwellings, right, they're counting things that they you know counting the animals they they killed and ate and things like that. So you know, however you define data, that's sort of what we've been using data for for a long time. But I don't think that there's new ways of reporting, there's new analytics. Um, but what's interesting that that was sort of flat year over year. That, that's a strong number. Um, we, we see that kind of, you know, staying fairly similar across the surveys. We've been doing these, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Shannon, probably the past five years. And it's kind of interesting to see the, the trends. So while that's great and, and not surprising that reporting and analytics will probably continue to lead the way, um, it's not necessarily the growth pattern that we see with some other areas where we did see a big increase um, is this idea of, of digital transformation. And so 64%, not quite as high as the, the pure analytics, uh, but you'll see that there's a lot of growth, over 10% growth year over year from the year before. Um, maybe not surprising either, um, but definitely interesting to kind of drill down into. If you're, if you're interested in kind of the other things that kind of bubbled up to the top, again, the two big ones are insights, through reporting and analytics, and then this idea of digital transformation that we'll talk a little bit about. Some of the other ones, again, maybe we get a little jaded of, yep, of course, we're, we're saving costs and increasing efficiency and reducing risk. I mean, those are always popular ones as well, but that also you know, speaks to the power of data to do those things. Um, I was talking to a customer this morning, I had this great quote, you know, data governance is what makes us faster and stronger and more agile. And I don't, that just was nodding heads in the room when, when she said that, but, you know, that might not have been the case, you know, a while back, and maybe even in your organization, that's not the case yet, you know, that people see that connection with strong data management, strong data governance, and efficiency, and, and, and things like that, because often it, it sometimes gets the, the other route that it takes too long, and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, some of the others, again, not surprising, and have been leaders for a long time, you know, complying with regulations, especially if you're in your financial or healthcare, um, not necessarily always what you want to drive with, not the sexiest part of it, um, but definitely a strong driver up there with, you know, customer satisfaction, growth, product quality. I, I liked this year that, you know, this made the top 10. Um, I, I just list the top 10, there were a lot more, um, but approving outcomes for health and education, I, that's more of, you know, maybe more your nonprofit, not everything is revenue and growth, right? And we've got several clients where their main data driver is outcomes, uh, outcomes for health, outcomes for mental health and outcomes for education uh, for children. And I think that's, that's really great. Um, so anyway, hopefully that, that's interesting too, but what sort of 
I think is it may be interesting to drill down a little bit is this idea of digital transformation. Is that just a buzzword? <laughs> is that, um, you know, is that, is that a trend? Is that old news? Um, I, I often like to go to the Gartner uh, Glossary. I think they've got a good definition for a lot of the, the, the terms and, and buzzwords out there. Um, so, and I, I think there is it's, it's a fair in some ways, you know, it's, it's, what does that mean? It could be anything from IT modernization, you know, for some folks that's moving to the cloud. Um, some of it's um, an entirely new business models where companies are, are either, you know, digital first um, or, or something like an Uber, right? Where you really transform the taxi business to more of a digital model. Um, Amazon.com, there's a good digital transformation, right? We don't go to bookstores, we, we go online. Um, and I think with COVID, that's even, you know, last year's version of this. We talked a lot about that, how COVID was driving digital transformation, where companies that weren't digital before certainly are now. Um, might push back a little bit on the Gartner man list who, who did this one of um, widely used in public sector organizations for modest initiatives like putting services online. I don't know, that's kind of a big deal, I think, if, if you've ever tried to do that, moving online for your services actually, I think is almost the definition of, of, um, of, of digital transformation. Um, so again, a lot of different definitions and, and uh, like I think December, we actually last month, and if you want to catch it um, on data diversity, we, we did a whole section, a whole session on digital transformation. What I found was kind of fun to go through was what does that mean in a different organization? We had a, a healthcare provider, one of our customers that for them, digital transformation was online telehealth. You know, maybe that's not super innovative for but to me it was um to them it was to their patients it was um and so that means a lot of different things to different people what, what i kind of think about when i wax poetic or whatever in my head um you know these these we can often dismiss these trends as buzzwords um but it also often becomes more just business as usual i, I always sort of laugh when people say you know the dot com and the dot com bust and it, maybe some companies went under but the whole idea of dot com is the way we work. You know, think of Amazon.com, one of the biggest companies on the planet is a dot com. So um, y yes, these things are buzzwords because they start to buzz and, and eventually maybe they we get jaded and just become so used to them that we forget that they're transformational. Um, and there's a lot of pieces that go to it. You know, a little call out to digital realty. And what, what, what Dan was saying is, you know, maybe that's the forgotten side of it that isn't the, no offense, <laughs> Dan, the sexiest side. Um, but you can't do all this digital transformation without without the back, so, you know, the, the stuff on the back end, without the infrastructure. And that's the stuff I think we just take for granted, um, but is a big part of this uh, digital transformation. Um, so what I also find sort of interesting is, you know, what, what, were the priorities in 2021? As I mentioned, what I find interesting is, is we do the survey every year. Again, some things always rise to the top, but, you know, BI and, and data warehousing always do. Some things kind of come and go. Um, and so when, when folks talking to the 2021 survey, absolutely number one was data warehouse and, and business intelligence. I, I see those as related but different. Um, unfortunately, I see Maybe too many companies doing the BI side, but not the warehouse or the, you know, there's different flavors of warehouses, but the hard work behind it. I mean, you can do BI on a spreadsheet. Um, so that might not be the best enterprise approach. So, but when you look towards the future priorities in 2022 and beyond, um, what's bubbling to the top is data governance and, and data strategy. And, and when I just use our practice as kind of a litmus test for that, are we doing data warehousing and reporting? Of course. What's our, one of the, some of our biggest drivers um, from our customers? Governance strategy, probably some of those other ones there, master data management is another big one. Um, because to do that third one on, on the list in 2022 and 23, self-service reporting and analytics, I think what a lot of people are realizing is you can't do that without great data. And I, I think, I don't want to say ironically, but maybe it's expected that you know the more people want to get into things like yeah, I mean, they're buzzwords, but they're true. Things like AI, machine learning, advanced analytics, and the more citizen data data scientists and citizen, you know, uh, self service BI start looking at the data, they very quickly realize that the data might not be great or it might not be trusted. And so, how do we, you know, really get that data governance in place to make the data trusted? So, it might not when we come to a webinar to say, what's the big hottest trend in data? data architecture <laughs> is data governance. Maybe that sounds like a letdown and it's not as sexy as we'd like when there's so many things like, you know, data mesh and, you know, fa fancy new platforms we can be using. But 
when it comes down to it, you can't do anything else without that. So I think people are going back to foundations. Data strategy, I, I almost think, I mean, data governance is across everything. Data strategy, um, I think that ties into people seeing data as a strategic asset, people wanting to be digital and, and having digital transformation. You can't do that without data. But I, I'm heartened by that because um, we do a, a lot of that as, as the name of our company, but um, it's getting, you know, getting business aligned with data and making those two sing together which I think is a great positive trend. Uh, and none of these others are surprised and probably aren't to you um, that things like quality architecture, metadata, again, maybe not the sexiest stuff that people see in the front end, but you, you can't live without it. So um, moving ahead on that, I, I also found interesting, you know, the question is who's driving data management? And, and be clear, most of these are multiple choice answers. So it's not you know, the, the only people, you know, it's, for example, when you see the CEO, I don't think the CEO is personally you know, putting together the roadmap for business intelligence, but it does mean that they're a champion of it. So that's real. I think the high number of C-level roles on this chart is very heartening. Uh, that the fact that data is a strategic asset is, is proof to that. I don't think we're too surprised by seeing a CIO or a CDO um, that's kind of in their role uh, but a CEO is really great, and, and those business stakeholders are great. Um, what I find super interesting, and, and we always say this to our customers as well, data governance lead is so critical to the organization, and I'm very not surprised and also very pleased that data governance lead um, is the top of that, because when, when, when we have someone ask us, you know, what does a good data governance lead look like? Yes, you have to understand technology. You don't have to be a tech person. I would actually not recommend that you, you come from tech, that it's generally a business person who can really be a champion in the organization and really get all of those different roles together and, and really be that driver of change uh, because that is what governance is about. It's as much of a change management um, effort as a technical effort, it's both. Uh, I don't want to belittle either, um, but that data governance lead is that unique type of person that can speak both, that they, they know what a warehouse is and why that's different than a data lake, um, but they can also go talk to the chief marketing officer and explain why you know her campaigns are gonna be better because of data, right? What I find, um, you know, a, a corollary here is you know, the chief data officer, not every organization has a chief data officer. I think that's a higher level of evolution. I wouldn't start, if you're just starting your journey, wouldn't start with the chief data officer. Um, you probably often start with a data governance lead. And, and for those on the call who are a data governance leader or aspiring, I think there's often a career path from data governance lead to CDO, um, because again, you, you kind of have to prove the value of data before that chief data officer role really even makes sense or have enough of a foundation for that to exist. But again, a good data governance lead is that champion for change, is able to get IT and business in the same room and herd the cats and, and, and get all the different motivations and, and really get that, that singing. So um, I, I think this, it, in my experience, is very representative um, to what I see in organizations. And I think also very heartening that you'll see there's a mix of business and tech and, um, and kind of how they work together. Um, so, um, Although it isn't always harmony and, and love and kumbaya when, when it is um, kind of business and tech, because both are hard. Tech is hard and people are even more hard. Um, and, and this might be a hard, maybe even the best visualization here, but bear with me for but a moment. Um, so what I found interesting, and I, this may not be the most pure analytics, I'm, at, I'm adding my own uh, version of truth here, but again, bear with me. What I found interesting is when we look at self-service BI, that's about 32% of organizations um, with 36, this is people planning to, in the future to do it. 36% already have it in place. So just to get, get this is again, future looking people that in the future are looking to do self-service BI. That's actually a decrease um, in the past few years since 2019. Um, but if you look on the other side, folks looking at data governance, a little higher percentage with even more having it in place. And that's an increase in 2019. These aren't huge numbers, it's a slight trend. Um, but it, another point from the survey is a lot of organizations really have trouble collaborating between business IT. And when they say, what's your impediment to success? That was the impediment. So what, what could help with that? You know, one of, it, one of the things is um, data governance. Data literacy we'll talk about in a bit is another big one. But my reading of this is I think a lot of people do want to do self-service BI. And as I mentioned before, as soon as you get into that, um, often 
you see that the data needs help. It's either not of data quality or we don't know who the owner is or we don't have the lineage. And we realize let's, let's pause a sec on the self-service and up the game on data governance. And a lot of the people doing self-service might be data owners in data governance, right? But the, 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 I think people are realizing that we want, we are data driven, we wanna do these great things, but before we can do that, we have to get those foundations in place. Um, I'm seeing a, a, a trend, um, to me it's not surprising, but everyone you know, sees the, the shadow IT or, or, or the part of you know, marketing wants better campaign data and dashboards and IT is just taking so long in that old fashioned data warehouse. Gosh, I don't know why they take months just to clean the data and get it out in a report. I can do that. Um, and it was me trying to kind of do, you know, and I always use the analogy, I was trying to do some work on my house and I was going to do it all you know homegrown and get the hammer and do it myself and it took me months and it was half as good and when I hired the person with the right tools and the right skills it took a couple of days um and so I but I realized how hard it, well, it didn't look that hard how hard is it to put up a wall you know I, I've seen walls my whole life how hard can that be um and I think sometimes there's a I've seen in our practice just recently uh, several folks that were the shadow IT that are now coming and saying, how do I build governance? Um, and, and the data warehouse folks maybe were kind of saying, I told you so, because some of this stuff just is hard. You, you, not everything's hard. There, I absolutely support self-service BI. There's a place for it. Um, and, and the tools that are available today really put the power in the hands of the user. And <laughs> to get that right, you need to have the right data. So to me, that's my reading of little bit of pause on the growth of self-service BI till we get our data right and we understand kind of who's doing what. Um, uh, a sister to that, as I mentioned, is this idea of data literacy. Um, self-service BI can be super powerful. It can also be dangerous. Do we understand the data we're joining? Do we understand how to join data um, that makes sense? You know, there's some data foundations with that. Also, and I, I feel this more than anyone, we're in a, a, a data, my company is data, and it's hard to find great data people who get the business as well. Um, and so there's a skills shortage in pure IT roles. And I think data uh, business, quote, business people, um, I think I did a webinar before on that, that blurring of the line between IT and the business is blurring. Um, I think business people either have been very data driven, but the tools didn't support it or are becoming data driven. You know, go to a finance person or a, an actuary in, in, in accounting, I mean, I'm sorry, in insurance and, and try to say they're not data driven. I mean, they're all about data, right? There's just a different flavor of data or a scientist who's doing, you know, study analysis. It's just a different type of data. So the more the tools, I think, and the technology uh, blend, then this alignment of whose business and who ties to, as IT kind of morphs a little bit. That said, in both IT and in the business, there is a skill shortage. So in the, in the survey that we pointed to in the beginning, um, th these were some statistics and a lot of kind of the write-in comment when we said, what is your biggest challenge? The, the literal words data literacy um, came up a lot. You know, what does data literacy mean? Maybe that's another buzzword. We kind of need to figure that out. And I, I know a lot of the companies I'm working with what does that mean? Does, does a business person need to know third normal form or really, you know, or do they need to know just enough um, and, and vice versa, how much of that? Yep. So sorry to interrupt you, but we're still seeing slide eight. Really? Yeah. Oh. All right. Let Thank me start sharing right. again. Well, thanks for pointing it out. Okay, well, thank you. Let me yep. try this again. Uh -huh. Yep, we're good. All right, let me go a little backwards because you missed all the cool stuff. Oops, sorry. Now everything is now. Sorry. Sorry, y'all. I didn't catch that earlier. Eight. That was quite a while back. I don't know why. We were just joking before that technology will always no, throw a few off. I could, they curse us. <laughs> I do think it, it's Shannon's fault because yes. she was saying that technology was actually working this year, this week. Um, <laughs> Okay, so this was when I was so wow, that was a long time back. Let me just do the quick so you can at least see the slides I was talking about that that data warehouse and and is kind of the morphing towards data governance, data strategy. Now I am changing my slide to say nine. Do people nine. see that? Yes, nine. We're good. Okay. Okay. So this was the whole five minutes I spent talking about roles, and you were probably wondering how that matched with the previous slide. So thank you for jumping in. Um, I'll pause for just a moment if people want to digest that. But this is where I was talking about, you know, the, that data governance lead um, is is really the top, but there's other C level roles as well. Um, and then this is where I was looking at the 
which probably made no sense as I was talking, on uh, kind of the numbers of, again, self-service is a bit smaller and decreasing and data governance is increasing. Um, and then I will move to slide 11 and you can now see the challenges faced. I am gonna pause just to check so we don't have the same problem. We good, Shannon? Shannon or someone? Or have I dropped all together and now- No, it's lost some of my issues. <laughs> yeah, we're good, we're good, I'm on slide 11, sorry. I'll be traumatized the rest of the week. Um, so this is where I was talking about, yes, there's a skill shortage and yes, there's a gap in how do we align IT with the business um, and data li literacy really has been kind of posed as a solution. So thank you whoever jumped in on the chat and I said that because I cannot see the chat at the moment. Um, okay, so this was a lot about the people and the process and the goals and the digital transformation. And, and for some folks in the call who expected an architecture conversation, I would say, well, this is part of architecture. And this is a big part of what makes architecture sing when we look at trends is getting that data governance right and really doing that alignment with the business. That said, I always find one of my favorite, again, we do this every um, year is kind of seeing the trends in the tech and the platforms and just confirming that we're on slide 12. I'm gonna keep doing this for a little bit just to make sure. You good? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah we're good. Okay. Slide right. 12. I will, uh, I will stop doing that now and no just worries. yell if it happens again. Will do. So um, we, we asked two questions. Uh, what are you using now? And what are you planning on using in the future? Um, and I, I, I super found this interesting. So despite um, discussion of its imminent demise, the good old uh, on-premise relational database continues to lead the top by a lot. I mean, not just sort of eking out a, a win here, it's just absolutely the overall winner. Um, what continues to keep me up at night and upset me and, and make me cry is that spreadsheets is number two in terms of, I mean, I guess I understand it. We did ask, is it a platform or a data source? either one isn't isn't great i mean i i don't want to say negative things about spreadsheets i use them all the time they have their purpose as an enterprise data management solution i would not suggest that for anyone um so that, but people are fairly honest on that at least and, and uh you know when, when i lived in the vendor world and people would say kind of what's your number one competitor i would say spreadsheets <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't the other vendor tools. It was the good old fashioned spreadsheet. Uh, I guess some of the others um, probably aren't a surprise. You know, package applications, is that a beta platform? Yes and no. I mean, sometimes I, I feel I need to push back that an ERP system is not master data management, even though MDM might be embedded, you know, your, your suppliers, your customers, et cetera, um, in some of these systems. You know, JSON and XML as a you know, data exchange format with JSON being a little bit more common is not a surprise to me. You know, the number of legacy systems, uh, good old fashioned COBOL, I think you can make a whole lot of money if you're the one of those few COBOL programmers out there. Um, and we can love to hate the mainframe, um, but you can also say, well, you know, that was the old waterfall development, and but it's still working. It's still there, right? So um, a little bit interested in this, the small amount of the data, big data platforms. Um, you know, Hadoop isn't the only one. We just had that as an example. Um, but this, there's a lot of hype around big data. There's a lot of great use cases for big data as well. So that one surprised me that it was um, quite as low, as well as some of the non-relational, both cloud and on-prem seemed a bit lower given, you know, given given what I'm seeing, honestly, and, and given that the, those are, um, there's some great use cases for it. So that, I mean, to be fair, that is what people are using today. That's not what people are testing or, or thinking about in the future. So that, that's the next question. Uh, please screen if you did not see the slide change. Um, and, and again, though, the good old fashioned relational database uh, wins the top. But the difference is that that cloud first um, paradigm is, is kind of coming through. And, and I see that as well, um, that, that the ease of implementation, the scalability, a lot of the good things about cloud are winning people over, but not everyone. Um, it isn't a cloud only, maybe cloud first, a lot of, lot of good reasons. Uh, 
you know, cost skills, some people see it as a risk in the cloud, um, that people do want to stay on on premises. So it isn't the only solution being in the cloud, and, and many have kind of a hybrid cloud solution as well. You'll see a bit higher for some of these non-relational cloud-based databases, which I think is great, and I think it's a both and. I do not expect the relational model to go away. It, it's super powerful for a lot of the operational data we use, um, but I think there's other tools in the toolkit, and, and I'll talk about that later. I'm also seeing a bit of morphing, just like people morph in, in this, this um, you know, distinction between all business and all IT is, is kind of morphing. I think the idea of you're, you're only a relational database and you're only a, a columnar store database, or you only do big data, um, to, you know, to drop a, a another buzzword, you know, this idea of a data lake house where it isn't, you know, either or, you, and some of the technologies are getting much more advanced. So, um, I think there's a lot of tools in the toolkit, and it, obviously, if you're only using relational databases, you I would suggest looking elsewhere for other use cases. Um, you know, graph and, and for for doing uh, you know, trend analysis and and maybe uh, key value pairs for trying to get some some really fast analytics. Um, but again, um, th I think there's an overlying between a lot of the hardware. I find it interesting that spreadsheets went way down uh, when you actually said, what are you planning to use? I, I was I was impressed with the honesty <laughs> from a lot of people that they realize it's not going away. Um, I think the reality is higher, but no one really wanted to admit that. Um, you don't see so much of the, the legacy in the, in the um, future um, and, and some of the others seemed, seemed right. Uh, this idea of streaming in real time, I am seeing a lot more of, um, but that, that, that could be a whole webinar, right? What, when does, real time makes sense and, and there still is a case for batch. You know, if I'm doing my financial close, I, I probably wanna wait for things to close. Um, but if I'm trying to get, you know, re real time order status, maybe I do want that a little more real time. Uh, so hope you found that interesting. I do. Um, and we'll continue to do that each each year and kind of see how the trend continues. Um, and, and, and who knows? I mean, I, I find it interesting, these buzzwords that become business as usual. Um, you know, we didn't say anything here, internet enabled, or right? Because that's just uh, obvious. Uh, and, and might cloud become the norm where we don't have a category for cloud relational and on-prem? Or will this still continue to be two valid options, uh, depending on the use case where some lives on-prem and some on the cloud. So I guess that's a stay tuned for next year's survey. Um, so moving on and tell me if it didn't. Um, oh, each year, I, you know, not to put too much weight on who I am, but I, I put my own little predictions um, and I, 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 I call myself against them. Did I do okay or was I vastly wrong? Um, and then we'll go into what my, my personal predictions might be for 2022 and beyond. So last year, um, uh, this, this, just stepping back, and it might seem like is 2021 and 2020 and 2022 any different? We're still in our living room in our pajamas with COVID, but, but um, it did feel a lot different than I think the, the focus of last year and last year's survey um, was a lot about COVID and reaction to that and needing to go digital. And, and, and really a lot of the survey responses didn't look it wasn't as much future looking a lot of it was just going back to foundations we need to do the basics we need to get our data quality right and governance but it wasn't too much forward thinking on it seemed more digital transformation as a reaction and not as a future plan this year's survey seemed a lot different that yes there's still a focus on foundations but um not so much of that but so we got that one that one right um I think this one's true as well as a lot of people and my customers use this time that maybe either things slow down or folks were, were forced to go more digital um, is to really build that data foundation. And a lot, several of our customers who had were having trouble kind of getting this digital transformation were kind of augmented by it, <laughs> um, by able to, I don't say use the pandemic because that sounds horrible, um, but that's a terrible thing, but um, kind of use that situation. A lot of, um, Folks I was seeing were, were doing a lot of COVID reporting. Um, and I we had one kind of nonprofit customer that does um, social services. And they said, you know, it was really hard to get some of our staff to understand why they needed dashboards. But suddenly they were looking at a COVID dashboard every single day and whether they needed to go in or not and whether the, you know, the patients could come in or not. Um, and it really hit home what data driven meant. So again, it was a, a terrible situation, but people were able to kind of get some good from it. Um, the one where maybe half right or partially right 
Um, I, I put a little bigger a push on this idea of business insights with not only BI, but advanced an analytics of predictive analytics, data science. I would say not as much as we expected, so maybe even an X. Um, I'm seeing a, a lot of folks wanting to get there, but are kind of stymied by um, by data quality issues or data governance issues or you know not getting data in, in a way that can be consumed for data science. So I would say every single one of our customers has some sort of data analytic, advanced predictive analytics, data science on their roadmap, but very few really are um, uh, get, doing that right. Not nobody, uh, so, uh, plenty of people at a higher level of maturity are, but um, I think folks are, are being held back a little bit. Data governance being strong, um, yep, uh, that's going to continue to grow as well as things that are related, master data, metadata, um, and, and investment in data management. Well, maybe you can you you can see with your own company, but I, I'm seeing it grow. I think a lot of the data management vendors and things are doing that as well. Um, that people are realizing to get this right, we really need data. So, um, but looking ahead, what, what's the next big thing for this year and, and, and beyond this year? This is just my personal opinion, not, not anything from the survey or anything from Dataversity sponsored. So get that caveat out there. Um, what, do, what, do I, what do I predict? So I think self-service reporting in BI, I think morphs a little bit into business-driven data governance. And what, what does that mean is that, you know, this, 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 this distinction between business and IT becomes less of a distinction. And it's more about how do we build trusted data sets? And that's both business people and it's tech people. And it's all of the groups bringing their right skill sets together and getting that right. And then, yes, of course, you know, maybe BI becomes an afterthought, just like, you know, dot com is the way of going. Maybe that's, that's not a trend anymore. It's just, of course, how could you not have a dot com if you're a company, right? So I think self service, uh, you know, and, and that idea of, self-service BI, it just becomes, well, of course, how else would you do it? I actually had a customer um, who was in a very lower state of maturity and then nothing against them. The great news that they're just starting. Um, but when they were talking about self-service BI, I was talking all about building your own reports and your analytics. And he, he literally meant, can, can I bring up my own dashboard without having to ask somebody to generate a report from me? Um, and that was so surprising because to me, that's I forgot those days. <laughs> we just expect to open up Power BI or you know Looker or something and to start slicing and dicing. But that wasn't the case not that long ago. Um, we, we didn't need now. We don't even ex expect to have to go to IT to get a report. Um, but um, so again, it, I think even building these trusted data sets will become more of a team sport. Um, and maybe this is my snarky in this number two. Data literacy will rise to buzzword status. I think it's already there. Um, I'm almost getting tired of hearing it. What, but what does that mean, <laughs> right? So do we need to understand data? Is data important? And, and I think I've seen some companies do this well. Of, of what is the, you know, the, the average user in the company knows have to know how to read a report, and, and that might seem simple. Um, but anyone who reads the news knows how numbers can be twisted. Um, so, you know, if, if I'm a CEO making decisions on data, do I know what that graph means and what it implies and how you know, the analysis was done to how people build their own reports? Maybe that's a citizen data analyst or someone that actually wants to build their own data hub or MART. And, and you know, again, there's a lot of layers of data literacy and, and I think getting that right and what that actually means. Should we get more people interested in data and knowing more about the fundamentals? Yep. But what does that mean? Uh, I think we'll just have to kind of spell out. Um, I think digital transformation pretty soon won't be a term or shouldn't be. That's just kind of business as, as usual. And that, maybe that's what Gartner was getting at when people are you know, only putting their services online. Well, you know, I'm, I'm really, I, I don't even think about if I did get my driver's license to do it online, you want to buy something, you do it online. Um, so um, that's not the only definition of the digital transformation, I, I realize, but I, I, I think that's just going to be the way of doing business. Um, Cloud first uh, approach for databases, I think will grow. Really curious if that, how, how much that becomes the only way or, or just becomes one of the ways. Um, and then this last one, number five, um, I do a lot of work with the, the vendors. It used, used to be one, now just play with them. <laughs> um, but I, and it's a lot easier that way. You just get to see this cool stuff and not have to actually build it. Um, but I, a lot of the database vendors and, and the platform vendors really are doing some cool stuff that again, it just gets cool and we forget about it. You know, again, giving a call out to the platform people, we just expect things to be performant and the, the volume of data that we, you know, I can even do on my laptop that you, you couldn't do before. Um, 
and, and the, the database platforms themselves, um, and maybe that's a, another webinar in and of itself, it isn't just a relational database, right? They're, they're getting some of the ideas of co columnar, I can't say that word, I just didn't even try column-oriented um, databases in, within the same platform, or the, again, that uh, fan of the term data lake house but yeah yeah that idea that you have some things in data lake storage and some things in more relational storage is kind of the same data ecosystem you know some might be streaming and, and some might be more batch and there's different options um i think both from the the pure database vendor level they're embedding it in the technology and from the implementation level you know it isn't just either or that you go to the data lake or you go to the data warehouse and it it is kind of a best of breed, which I think is great. And I think pretty soon that'll just be so obvious. We don't even talk about it. Seriously, you, you old folks used to just separate, you know, structured data from unstructured. Why? Why'd you do that? Um, and of course, we know why we used to do that or maybe still do that. Um, but I think, again, the technology is improving so much that it'll be more of a kind of a best of breed um, thing that we don't even think of anymore. So um, I do want to open it up for questions because I'm sure there'll be some heated discussion as there always is um, or interesting discussion. Um, so kind of what are the, the takeaways? This idea of business insights and, and analytics and, and digital transformation continues to be drivers. Uh, more and more business roles are, are part of that or IT roles are part of business or however you want to say it. Um, they're morphing. Data literacy, data skills will be important, whatever we want to call it. Um, and there's a lot of tools in the toolkit. It isn't just relational databases, but don't don't knock them either. They're still <laughs> the, the analogy I like to use is these things aren't all old fashioned. They're they're foundational. Like Tesla is a super super advanced car, but it still has wheels. You know, and we invented the wheel thousands of years ago. Um, you don't knock you don't knock it. You you just use it as a foundation to build upon it. Uh, just like the Tesla did. So um, before I open it up for questions, just a reminder that this is a monthly series. So if you like this and want more, uh, we'll be doing another one in February on, on data strategy and, and how you can kind of build a strategy for your organization. Um, blatant plug that we do this for a living. So um, if you need help, we're happy to share. Oops. And then I will open it up to thoughts, questions, ideas in the Q&A. So Shannon, over to you. Donna, thank you so much. And sorry, I didn't catch that earlier. So on the slides, but glad we got it working again. Um, so uh, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording for this webinar. So uh, diving in here, and Dan, we invite you to welcome, come back in during the conversation. I often see gaps between marketing and IT where marketing is collecting data through Adobe, Google, et cetera, but it, IT is focusing on data warehouses, data lakes, data, uh, taking data from CRM, other systems, but the quote unquote marketing data is not necessarily connected. Do you see that as well? I see that as well. I see it all the time and I see it. I wouldn't even just say marketing. Um, it's, it's finance, it's engineering. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And then that that's probably a good call out. Um, some, some good and bad reasons. I think some of the good reasons, a lot of, I mean, everybody is getting that things are data driven. A lot of the, the core tools are putting a lot of embedded analytics um, in, in their tools them, themselves. I actually, we had a healthy discussion uh, with a client this morning in finance. And she said, I don't understand why you need a warehouse that the, the our finance reporting tools are so good. It gives us everything we need. Um, and she was right. And they also need a warehouse because it's not everything that just she needs, right? So um, her costs need to be fed into engineering so they can estimate better, right? And so um, th I think that's a, a limitation, I, I guess a risk of there are really good analytic tools out in that marketing ecosystem. Um, and, and maybe that's enough for the marketer. Um, can, can either they benefit from some of the insights that might be in a warehouse or another group and vice versa. And so I think I think that's a great case of a both and, but the, those silos need to be broken down and you, you don't wanna just keep everything on necessarily one platform or, or maybe that's a, you know, that is a good virtualization option or something, but there has to be some kind of integration generally to kind of get that full benefit. But uh, open to what Dan has to say, if you had any thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I, I do. I, I think it's a little bit of what I, you know, kind of alluded to right at the beginning is, is you know, when we don't have this dialogue, right, that I think needs to occur, not only between the, the provider, right, IT in this case, and the consumer, the marketing department in that example, but between the various consumers as well. Um, you know, because we're, how many of us, you know, are taking data that, you know, I, I get a report, 
okay, from someone in finance that, that the, the report is perfect for them, it built for them. I want to derive my own insights from that and integrate that into some marketing data that I have. So, you know, how do we make sure that, that there's opportunities to build that? You know, and being sensitive to the fact that typically IT, right, is, is kind of gets the, the sad part of the job, which is right, juggling, keeping the lights on and, and you know, trying to be a good partner to the business and, and driving change and digital transformation, probably while being asked to do it, keeping budgets flat. So, you know, like the first step is to get the dialogue going and, and just generate the awareness. Um, you know, and, and hopefully we'll we'll get there. Like I said, as a marketing person, I'm super sensitive to that. I, I oftentimes say, man, I wish I could go outside of corporate boundaries and do something because I, I know I could get what I need faster, easier, and possibly even cheaper. I love it. So Donna, taking us back to slide number eight. Would you oh, have... that's the one I was stuck on. Now I'm traumatized. I know. <laughs> Maybe I need to give all the slides up longer because people. We, are we all had a lot of time to analyze that. Well, there's a lot of things to do. <laughs> Would you um, uh, explain the discrepancy in percentages? The discrepancy in percentages. I am I, with it that the future priorities are lower overall. The one only goes up to forty five percent. Is that what they mean? Uh, very possibly, yeah. Oh, or could it mean, oh, this was a more than, uh, choose more than one, that's probably the answer, that you're right, that 60% uh, of 60% of 60% doesn't add up to 100, uh, that's probably no, no, what they I mean. It was about no? the percentages, interest is, yeah, it says for, about the percentages at the bottom, so, yeah. I, I guess there, there's two, several answers to that. I think the, the biggest one was that it was multiple choice, so it does, they don't add up to 100, and I should, I put that on some of the others, probably should have put it on this one. Um, that the overall responses were lower in 20, the highest one is only 45%. Um, maybe the, I think the distribution was uh, a little bit wider on, on some of these. Um, um, otherwise, I can't speak to that. I'm not sure why fewer people, um, uh, I think it's about the same for governance. It probably stayed the same, but relatively it's bigger. Yeah. But I think that the main was that probably why the numbers don't add up. <laughs> Yeah, no, that absolutely. Yeah, that, that'll teach me to leave a slide up. People look at, too, <laughs> look at it too long and look at the details. I'm going back to the question slide. Well, know. of course, the uh, the chart uh, range changes based on the highest percentage of the answer. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, how long does it take for an organization to adapt and succeed in data governance? Uh, we are good to have a data governance. Uh, we are going to have a data governance group, a new one. Great question. Um, uh, should I give the consulting answer? It depends. Um, but but it, it's a journey, and I want to put that out there. Um, more and more, we're, we're kind of mixing in the companies we work with, kind of a full-on organizational change management effort with your data governance. You know, I always uh, quip, and it's true, that I mean, tech, tech is hard to change, but it, it can be a lot faster to change than hearts and minds and people. And I think if you look at any of the organizational change management frameworks like ProSci is just one of, of many, and they, they start any change effort with the people understand why they understand, um, you know, that they're a part of it and, and all of that motivation before you get to the how. And I think what I've seen some data governance efforts do wrongly is focus right on the how. You know, here's how you fix your data quality, but didn't kind of step back, you know, because we in data are so involved in that, we jump right to that and kind of forget that people have a day job and what's in it for me and, and how this might be a different way of working. And it may seem like it's slowing things down, even though in the long run, we'll speed things up. Um, so, so it'll be a, a journey, uh, but I don't want to dishearten people. What we also often do when, when we do data governance is pick some sort of quick win there's generally some pain point that's such a pain point that everyone can feel it that um, you can get some results in, in a short time period, three months, you know, six months. And I would say that whatever, if you, especially if you're starting a new governance org, pick something that's easy to fix. It could be, I mean, one of it was, um, it was for a nonprofit and they cleaned up address data. Um, and it, for them, that was a really easy fix. They used some external tools and cleaned it up and they were very quickly able to see because they were having a, a campaign come up people who they had fixed the addresses for, they got like another $100,000 that they wouldn't have gotten. And that was just such an easy, this is when we fixed data quality and we did it together, we saw the result. It can't always be quite that fast or that like obvious, um, but the idea was they picked something that would make sense to people. Um, for another one, it was actually was a marketing where they had marketing and sales together um, 
and they realized why the campaign data wasn't right and they picked it for them. It was email addresses, again, a really tiny, small thing. Uh, and they fixed that and they were able to really see how the marketing campaigns improved. So I would just say, do, and, and data governance can seem really theoretical. So if you have a committee, get them together doing a thing. I often don't even tell them they're on the committee until after you've done the thing. And then you say, wasn't that good? And, and, and they say, oh, yeah, I, I want to keep doing that. And you say, well, that's governance. And, and the role you just played was a data steward. Or, and then they can kind of, oh, yeah, sure, I'll continue doing that. But going to a random person who's busy and says, now you are now dubbed as a data steward and you must do these things can just sometimes seem really weird. Um, so the more you just get people doing stuff <laughs> that shows value, I, I would say, how long does it take to finally answer your question after a long time? Um, make it three months, make it six months. Otherwise, you're not going to get that long-term growth because people will get bored or, or frustrated. <laughs> um, but open to what Dan has to say on that one. I, I, I mean, I think that's the really great advice. I, I think it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's understanding, right, and making reasonable goals and, and arranging them into milestones is when we see people having success. Yeah, I, I think because it's all about momentum, right? Yeah, exactly. So do you see a general trend towards decentralized, decentralized data management and how are organizations approaching this? I'm actually not. I'm actually seeing the trend the other way. I, I think it seems like decentralization. Well, maybe it depends what we mean by decentralization. Um, federated, you know, getting more people involved in data management, maybe that's that, that blurring of, of IT and, and business, um, I think there, there has to be some centralized approach or plan and, and then decentralized can work a little better if you know, you know what I mean. What we don't want to have is silos. Um, and I think sometimes when this decentralized, it can quickly become silos. So whether it's a centralized governance group that, that you know, it has, has representation in, in the various groups. Um, and I've seen some folks kind of go, go the other way. For it. And, and maybe it's also a depending, right? It, it, that, that famous, it depends. Certain things like your core master data, my, my product list, my customer list, um, some of those things should be centralized. Um, and then maybe things like analytics or, or some of the use cases, or, or you know, maybe it's the classic warehouse versus mart uh, approach. Some of those can be more decentralized, but I'm actually not seeing that so much, or I've seen folks kind of try that and then get a little frustrated because it wasn't done in a correctly orchestrated way. So maybe my answer is central orchestration, and then data may be descent a little less centralized, but there has to be at least a planned approach to keeping keeping the cats herded together a little bit. I love it. Dan, anything you want to add to that? Well, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, it comes into the, to the point of view, right, where you're standing. I mean, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is the data itself it continues to be, um, and sometimes vexingly, distributed. But yeah, I would agree that folks that are successfully leveraging their data are doing that because, you know, they, they've centralized in, in the important pieces, largely the management of it, the governance of it. Um, you know, the data itself, uh, some of the processes actually dealing with the data don't necessarily have to be, right? But, but there's got to be, you know, I don't know, to use an analogy, right? Only one set of hands on the steering wheel or, or things get really wild. Yeah, and I, th I think just ad admitting that and getting that in the right is one of the cruxes of, of governance. We're not going to mess with your business processes. We're not going to mess with, you know, maybe 70% of the stuff you use to do your day job. But, you know, part number, can we agree on that? You know, because that's going to make us all more efficient because we all share part number. I think getting that right balance can also kind of get people less nervous about governance. We're not here to change your world. We're here to help your world. And there's certain things that are shared and certain things that aren't. And just setting those boundaries early, I think, is really helpful. I think one of the other things I'd just add, and this is mm -hmm. a little bit of it because of human nature, right? Yeah. Is, is the dialogue needs to include, and, and people get frustrated this with this, I think, but it needs to include the why. Mm -hmm. right? why, why is someone asking to have a certain thing a certain way? You're going to get more buy-in faster because people are like, oh, okay, I get it, right? Your process has this kind of dependency and okay, I can work with that, right? And, and again, and it can go both ways. A lot of times, right, when you come in, you're just like, it's this. It, no, right? You get, yeah. you get a lot of nodding, but then no activity. Yeah, and that, that ties into the earlier point about that organizational change management, which does a really good job of starting with the why. Why and what's in it for me and how I'm involved before you tell them the what, because otherwise you're right, people that I don't want, no one wants to be told what to do. They want to feel like they're a part of something. And that was my point of also starting early with, 
with governance, get everyone involved in it so it's their thing, not something you're telling them to do. It's just, again, we're all human. We, we have our own motivations and, and just you know acknowledge that it goes a long way. All right, well, I'm afraid that is bringing us to the top of the hour here. That is all the time we have for this session. Thank you, Donna, so much as always. And Dan, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to Digital Realty for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. Just a reminder, again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar uh, with links to the slides, the recording, and I'll get you a link to download um, the, the paper as well. Uh, I'll just get you a copy of the paper for you all so you can take a look at it. I uh, hope you all have a great day. Thanks to our attendees for being so engaged. Love it as always. Enjoy. Thanks again, Donna. And thanks again, Dan. Thank you. Thank always you. a pleasure. Thanks all.